Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Pick Swap Podcast. Coming off a great Sixers win last night, I'm James Brand. I'm here with Sean Bernard. Sean, how you doing, brother? Yeah, I'm, I think I'm a, a little embarrassed to admit how hyped up I am after that win last night. I definitely went in with the mindset of kind of like the season starts once James Harden's here. Didn't have any real expectations for that game, and my my low bar was uh, well jumped over. So awesome win. Uh, Joel Embiid refuses to have two bad games in a row. Uh, the Sixers showed up for sure last night. George Niang, the uh, the Giannis stopper, and uh, he <laughs> runs through Philly. So I could not be happier. Yeah, man, they move up to third, tied third mm-hmm. in the East now, going into the All Star break, which is, I don't know, I I think it's better than a lot of us expected, especially now still uh, without a second star having mm-hmm. played. Uh, but before we get into all that, we're going to talk again about our sponsorship with Bet US. Uh, BetUS is a leading online sportsbook and casino on the market. They have been in the industry for 25 years and currently expanding, which we're super excited to be a part of. Make sure you log on to BetUS and feel a little bit more involved in our game using our promo code PICKSWAP as a first-time depositor to use cash on some great opportunities. The Sixers were six-and-a-half-point dogs last night. Yeah. Dogs last night, and they come out with a win, a three-point victory. It looked bad at times down the stretch. I was a little bit worried in that late game. I don't know what the hell was going on. Um, we can get into that. I mean, Embiid, 42. What was it, 42 and 14? Uh, yeah, 42, 14, and 5. Jesus. So, yeah. like, a, a toe-to-toe with Giannis. Giannis, the, the Mr. Defensive Player of the Year. I, I've really I've really um, backed off of my slander of Giannis on the Kumbo, but when you sit there and you watch Bobby Portis get rotisserie cooked for an entire 40 minutes between Serge Ibaka and Bobby Portis, and you're the – defensive player of the year and you won't uh man up and 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 take Joel Embiid on any defensive possessions I think it was only like three in the entire fourth quarter where Giannis was actually lined up and was taking Joel Embiid on uh defensively so I loved what I saw and I I think that MVP conversation gets uh that's one of the ones where you one of those games you look at you say okay that was MVP versus MVP one guy had a full strength team basically Mm -hmm. uh I guess they had a couple guys out they had Grayson Allen and a couple other guys but, you know, the Sixers don't have anybody really right now. And Embiid uh, goes out there, carries that team. So how are you just feeling about Embiid, the MVP conversation, and, and his matchup with Giannis after last night? Uh, very very good about everything. I mean, his odds keep shortening and shortening for MVP, which is uh, awesome to look at. And, uh, I mean, last night, what, like you said, was kind of a one of those games where it's kind of like a, a notch on the resume as well. And uh, there was a lot he did getting to the free throw line. He ended 11 for 14 from the line. Uh, he he baited a little more than I would like to see at times going down the stretch there, but that is part of Embiid's game. And yeah. he, he did have that the one back down on Bobby Portis, that kind of a post fader that was a, a big bucket to uh, uh, put him on top. And I, I think that put him up four at that point. And uh, I will hop on the Giannis slander a little bit as far as I, as a as a player, you can't hate how good he is in the open court. He's yeah. one of, probably the best in the NBA. But uh, he is a fraud defensive player of the year candidate in terms of who he actually guard. There were possessions last night where he was matched up with Matisse Thybul. And it's like, dude, if you think of yourself as like a, a legitimate top tier defender, like you just can't you just have to have the stones yeah. step up and guard a little more. And even like if it's like a, a Tobias Harris matchup or a, something that I, at least like I can, you know, feel a little better about if I'm a Giannis uh, looking at it from a Giannis point of view. So that's always frustrating me about him. Uh, in the playoffs, I think it has to happen that it has to be Giannis and Embiid guarding each other. I think in a in a seven game series that we have to see that for a quite like a, a lengthy stretch at least for uh, good portions of the game. And I'm very excited by the addition of James James Harden. When we think about like this team as a whole, and I was talking about this last night with a bunch of people, like Giannis and Embiid are very much in that top tier level of stars. I think Harden is like worlds better than Middleton or Holiday. And that right there, like that top heavy advantage toward the Sixer gives me huge hope. And that's for just about every team that we're talking about matching up with. A few exceptions. There's very deep teams, but there's a lot of fun playoff matchups that could happen. So I'm getting very excited for postseason. Yeah, seven game series between the Sixers and Bucks would be very, very entertaining no matter who you root for. Um, there's a couple things like last night. I mean... Giannis, <laughs> Giannis, he like he was totally super quiet throughout the game. Uh, you know, the fourth quarter is really where he started to take over offensively. Um, and there's things that you that he does that you just can't stop. Here's yeah. what I will say again: he gets away with more shit than anyone in the league. 
you know, even in the late, the last bucket that he had against Embiid, he ran in and just fully pushed and laid up. And, yeah. you know, Niang took the charge, love uh, which love it. loved that, loved that. Uh, but then he turns around and complains. And then you look, you look up at the replay and it's like, yeah, man, uh, his feet weren't necessarily set, but you put your head down and ran through him like a running back. That's illegal. Uh, and that's been illegal since the dawn of basketball. So, like, I don't really understand. You know, a lot of guys they're complaining about him, and and a lot of Bucks fans were complaining about Embiid getting to the line so much. And it's like, well, first of all, you fouled him. Like he's he gets fouled. He Embiid gets fouled. Giannis goes to the line on average more than Embiid does. So sure. like, let's and he's plays. I don't know. I don't want to say similarly, but Embiid relies on more finesse. Yeah. Than than Giannis does. Like Giannis is throwing his body around and pushing people out of the way. Like that's how. I don't know. I, I don't and, know. And Bede's more like calculated and tactical and like how he gets yeah. to the line is he's trying to like bait your arm in it. There's one he got Bobby Portis when they trapped him where just like the second Portis drops his arm, he's going right up into yeah. it. And like there is like a, a strategy behind it for sure. Giannis yeah. is a lot more just kind of like run at you and see what happens. And I mean, he ended last night. He had he was four or five from the free throw line, only got there five times compared to Embiid's 14. Tyrese Maxey, 10 of 10 from the free throw line last night, That's which huge. is a huge deal. That's 10 free points. He ended with 19. Very good Tyrese Maxey game. Uh, super cool moment when uh, yeah. James Harden yelling off the bench. You saw him kind of coach him up a little bit. And then Maxey had the and one and Harden's just yelling, thank you. Thank you. So very cool moment there. Uh, it's cool to see. I mean, first off, the, the red carpet has been laid out for James Harden here. Everybody is so ready for him to just take this opportunity and run with it, uh, especially Philly media wise. Every, like the, the, the red carpet, Everybody, everything is set up perfectly for him to just come in here. Everybody's making a, the the biggest deal out of the littlest things he does, which I love. It's awesome the, yeah. the love that's been given his way already. So I'm I'm very excited to see this guy fully take the court next to everybody. Yeah, and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit about the way that he's gonna impact this team and the way they play and who he's gonna help the most. And I think Tyrese Maxey is on that list. But when you look at last night, I mean, like immediately, like it was actually immediately the the timeout they showed it right before they they brought the ball back on the court literally right before you saw James Harden standing with Tyrese talking to him. And there was a couple plays earlier uh, in the game where the, they were shooting free throws and Harden called Maxi over and had him run over to the bench and talk to him there. Like that's huge. Um, yeah. And I think that's something that's going to be super underrated with his uh, presence here is just his ability to coach Tyrese Maxi and help guys out. And, and, and Niang mentioned it after the game where he turned the ball over once or twice because he was dribbling too much. And, Harden said, stop that uh, yeah. and try to get 10 threes up because that's what you do. And he tried. Uh, he did his best. <laughs> and he did. And he and he went five of 10 from the three-point line. And he was, you know, I think Niang was one of the more probably, you know, if you talk about Tobias had 19, Maxi had 19, but Niang had 18. And I think his game was just as, if not more important than everyone but Embiid. Like his, his scoring and his defense. And he was out there closing the game. When you know they're they have got other guys to be out there, and they they decided to go uh, with Furkan and Niang and other guys, and you know Matisse had a pretty pretty bad game, but like it's nice to see that there's some versatility there, and uh, Niang is able to do a little bit more than I think a lot of people expected, and that was the best game of his Sixers career for sure. Yeah, I, I love George Niang. Uh, excellent signing this offseason. When we think about like. The, we really just haven't had a functioning backup power forward in quite some time, probably since Ersan yeah. Elisova is the last guy I can think of that rotationally actually made a, a difference like that. Like Mike yeah. Scott was kind of the, the held out. We got that brief like 20 game stretch where he was the man and that's about all we got out of him. And yeah. Niang, there's absolutely like limitations to his game, but just as far as like energy, mentality, willingness to just let it fly, they're, they're all things that help the Sixers team a ton. And like, I talk a lot about him kind of being just like the asshole that this team needs, but it's absolutely true. Just the way he chirps, the way he yeah. brings the energy. And even like when you look at last night, like he's taking charges on Giannis. He's guarding the former two-time MVP. He's the, like doing his best on a guy that like, if you, you lo saw these guys next to each other, you would never guess that both of them are NBA players. So very yeah. cool to just see Yang <laughs> just like, getting down in the dirt, doing whatever is possible. And he helped this team. Absolutely a terrific game from him last night. Yeah. And again, like he provides something that they don't have. Like you said, uh, a, a chucker. I mean, Quirkmaz, obviously, but Quirkmaz is, um, 
I don't know. It looks like he's lost his confidence a little bit. Last night, he looked a little bit better. He played well four. last night. Yeah, three or four from three last night, which I'm happy to see. Yeah, and because we haven't seen that. And it would be nice to see Furkan get back in that groove. And again, that's something, he's another guy that will benefit. Like, not that I think everyone's going to benefit from James Harden being here. Um, but I think Furkan specifically, Danny Green specifically, those guys are going to uh, benefit a lot. And, um, you know, having him out there, like you said, he's a, he's a confidence guy. He's yelling. Every time he makes a three, I was laughing because oh, yeah. he just immediately turns to somebody. It's like, you know, whoever draws the lowest card, whoever's closest to Niang is getting yelled at for like <laughs> 10 seconds after he makes a bucket. And, you know, defensively, he was really good, uh, surprisingly. I think yeah, that, I don't think he, he tries he really, hard. really hard, yeah. which <laughs> is worth something. I mean, there's not for much sure. to do to stop Giannis, but it definitely means something. Um, Tobias Harris. One of those games, man, I just don't know. There's times where I'm like, okay, he's back. He hit the and one jumper uh, in the fourth quarter to kind of slow things, sure things up. And he had a couple uh, really nice plays, but then he has some plays where I'm just like, dog, you got to yeah. figure it out. Um, so how'd you feel about his game last night? Yeah, I mean, looking forward, like he has to be willing to catch and shoot. Uh, like yeah. the three-point numbers are just down so much. If he pump fakes, like we just talked <laughs> about Nyang for so much. Like th thinking ahead to like these closing lineups, if Toby is going to pump fake and dribble in the contested twos, we absolutely have to like consider like Niang, Niang, Danny Green, and like Matisse as like the other two. Or, or D, I'm sorry, and Maxi in there as well. The bottom line is like I don't think Toby is a, a guaranteed lock for fitting in this team in the way. Which I mean, we've yeah. talked about this for so long, and it's again, it's so frustrating because like I know you can do it. I know you can shoot threes. I know you can knock them down at like an acceptable rate. You just have to be willing to like let it fly so just like the slow decision to bias just needs to continue to be like just taken out of his game i think i i'm confident though or maybe not confident i'm hopeful that that will change um i'm hoping that you know with the addition of james harden like the decisions that tobias has to make immediately decrease to like a minimal value which sure. is what we saw with him last year like tobias was really making his own decisions like a lot of times simmons was creating stuff for him or Embiid mm -hmm. was creating stuff for him, or it was the default, like, okay, you know, they're focusing on, on everyone else, Tobias, here's your chance to get that bucket. And I, I think in the way that I've, uh, the vision I have for this season going forward is Tobias is going to be, his role is going to be minimized, but in the perfect way that he doesn't have to make critical thinking decisions and, you know, off the dribble passes and things like that, which I'd love to talk about Maxi and his growth yeah. in the live ball skip passes have been incredible. Um, but like Tobias is at his best when the decision is front of him and all he has to do is execute. He's a good shooter. We know he's a good shooter and there's been stretches and times this year where it's been bad, but there's also been stretches of times where it's been good. Um, and attacking the basket, uh, taking advantage of mismatches. Those are, that's what Tobias does. Straight line drives, getting to the rim, um, and not getting too cute. Cause there's times like where he can actually just dominate, um, his defender and whether it's a bigger guy that he can just get blow past, or if it's a smaller guy that he can uh, put down in the post and give the work to like one way or another, I think Tobias, I'm hopeful that uh, the woes that we're seeing with the, the decision-making and, you know, kind of doing too much. Sometimes I'm hoping that that kind of will pass uh, yeah. with the time with Harden. He has to be content with like scaling back his usage rate a little bit. Like there has to be there. I, we have to take out of the playbook that just like give it to bias and watch because Tobias, like when you think about the, just like an ISO situation, especially James Harden is way above the list on guys who should get this touches more. But like Harden and Bede and Maxi all have like individual like skill, separating skills to like create space, get a bucket. When you think about Maxi's pace and Bede's size and polish, Harden's like just overall, just he's an isolation master. And Tobias just doesn't have like a distinguishing skill that like sets him apart from it. Like he's not especially fast he's not especially strong he's not especially long he's just a very like well-rounded overall solid player but there's not like a an area where like we can capitalize and there's certain matchups where like he'll have the size or there'll be but it's so often that like his iso get a bucket is him like attempting to post up not getting anywhere and then settling for like a fadeaway contested too and it's just like that's not how we run a an effective offense and that just can't be happening. And the I mean, the three he's he's up to shooting thirty four point five percent from three on the air. That number was down pretty a de pretty decent bit earlier in the season. But he's still three point four attempts. Like Maxi's attempting more threes per game now. 
that so is Embiid. Embiid's attempting more threes per game than Tobias. And those are things that, like, I, I just want to see more. Like, he shot five threes per game the first two years he was with the Sixers. Like, that's a, a, 1.6 threes per game is a pretty big margin to, to shrink down to, yeah. especially considering, like, his role has grown. Like, his expectations and what he's – the the slice of the pie that he's eating right now is bigger than it was then. That was with with Jimmy Butler, with Ben Simmons, with Joel Embiid, with that team. He was shooting JJ. more threes with JJ. He was shooting more threes than he is right now, which is just crazy to me. Yeah, and then, yeah, I mean, you even think last year, like yeah, same there's thing. Three point shooters everywhere, and he yeah. still was able to get shots up. Yeah, I mean, again, what I'm like, what I'm praying happens really is basically allowing James Harden to. Um, and I guess, I guess we can move right into that because, you know, we might as well at this point, because like one of the questions we wanted to talk about today, um, was whether, you know, who is James, Gar James Harden going to help the most? Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I mean, like I said earlier, I think it's going to be a pretty long list of guys that he's going to yeah, help. And, sure. you know, I, I think personally, um, on a long term standpoint, I think for a guy's career and what he's going to do for his career, I think it's very easily maxi. Yeah. Um, and the, the the impact that these years with James Harden is going to have on Tyrese Maxey and the rest of his career. Um, it's, it's scary. The thought um, of what he may become with mm -hmm. that type of mentorship from a guy like James Harden. So long-term wise, I think it's James Harden right now though. I think it actually this season, it might be Tobias the way that I look at, it. I don't know. How do you feel? Yeah. I also think the um like, responsibility taken off Tobias will help him a great deal. Just the pressure and not being looked at as like the, the number two, I think will go a long way. I'm going to give, again, like you said, it's a lengthy list. There's just about every guy on this roster. He helps to some extent, but I'm tossing it to Danny Green for the guy that I think yep. is going to benefit the most for, for this season. I mean, Danny Green is a guy that just lives for catching and shooting corner threes. And uh, it has it, he's missed Ben just as much as anybody as far as just being set up with those kind of things. I think Harden's a higher IQ passer than Ben than Ben Simmons straight up, and I'm like, this is a guy who's leading the NBA in assists per game right now, over ten a game. I think there's going to be a lot of like passes where guys are like surprised to find the ball in their hand, ready to shoot it, and I think Danny Green's going to be the biggest beneficiary of that. I also uh, sneaky Charles Bassey is one for me. I think the pick and roll. I think Bassey gets a shot with the the second unit just based on he's the type of big man that Harden has played with pretty much throughout his whole career in terms of lob threat, athletic, pick and roll guy who has the frame to be it like in the same way that he did with like Clint Capella out in Houston for so long. Just a guy that can pick roll, Harden can throw it up for him. I think Bassey is going to get a chance and I think it's going to look pretty good. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope so. Um, you talked about uh, going back to Danny Green. I think I really agree with that as well. A guy that, you know, makes his money off of catching and shooting. And yeah. uh, there just weren't, there just hasn't been as many opportunities uh, this season because of the fact that they don't have Ben or they don't have, they don't have a true point guard or a guy that, that really their job is to facilitate as, as well as Maxi has played um, at the point guard position. We all know that he's not uh, fully a point guard right now and hit, hit more if his job is to get to the rim. Uh, more of his job is to score and create opportunities for himself. And, you know, in turn, that creates opportunities for other people. But James Harden is getting 10 assists a game. Like, he's yeah. dropping 10 dimes on a nightly basis this season so far. And, like, he was playing for a majority of the season with guys that, you know, his second best player at times was DeAndre Bembry, who just got waived and then re-signed. Like, th yeah. that's the level that we're playing at right now. So I think I think Danny Green, obviously Niang, we talk about basically all the for shooters – Mm -hmm. Frick on uh, Matisse Thibel as a cutter, I think is going to yeah. benefit from a guy that can hit him consistently like that. Um, I don't know. I mean, Joel, and, obviously, I think. Yeah, Joel, uh, to find Joel on like early sets or deep post ups or like having uh, that sort of entry pass is going to be awesome. Like, Joel's going to love that too. There's so many times, and I mentioned this last night, I was watching with my roommate. Mm -hmm. Like, there's so many times where eight or 10 seconds goes off the shot clock where it's just and beads in the post fighting for position. And then like yeah, two guards that. are passing it from like the short wing to like the top of the key and back trying to see which way will help like get him the ball the easiest way. Like, and there's just time running off the clock. And it's like, I know that Embiid needs the ball right there. And I know that he needs to get in the post, but having a guy like James Harden, who is just, if he's just like, nah, like it's not going to happen. I'll just take my guy one-on-one. -on -one, like, that's a guy we have now. Or if he's like, okay, I'm clever enough to get him the ball in a where, you know, in a place that he can 
more easily score from that position. I think Joel is going to benefit a lot uh, from that. Kind of like what you said, Ed, I think. Um, and in pick and rolls. Like, I know Embiid's not a real great, you know, roller. notorious roller, but he can, and he's mm-hmm. smart, and he knows how to find spots. Uh, and he might not be a lob threat, but we've seen him go up and get it. So I think that there's going to be some surprising, um, you know, plays with the two of them. And just briefly before we move on, I, I'm not sure. I listened to the the Rice to Ricky Sanchez podcast with Daryl Morey. Did you get a chance to listen I did, to that? Yeah, I did. So they talked about the buyout, uh-huh. um, which really enjoyable podcast. I'm not a fan of Spike Eskin. Um, not normally a fan. I actually have. I don't even know if you can see right there. The Rice to Ricky Sanchez above me. I went to see a live show, but before I didn't like the Eskins. It was a <laughs> little bit more naive back in the day. Um but Maury was on there for like an hour. It was awesome yeah. to listen to him talk about everything. But he said, you know, we have a buyout guy that's it's happening. Uh, we just haven't been able to announce it yet. So do you have an idea of who that may be? It, it, it sounds like it's a big. I don't want it yeah. to be a big. I, I, I think adding like a, an athletic wing would be so much more impactful to the Sixers team. Like, and I, I was like the most like normal kind of basketball mold, like the, the Gary Harris type. Yeah. The, Trevor Ariza, Eric Gordon, that kind of cut of player, just a guy that can have some size, is a wing, can shoot the ball. But if that's a, a Sean Bernard opinion, not a, a Sixers opinion. It sounds <laughs> like that the the Sixers are very interested in adding a uh, a big man to you know have a, a fourth backup for their best player, I guess. So I, I understand like the Joelis meaning the minutes and how important it is, but I also Paul Millsap looks very playable to me. He looks like a guy that like. I'm not scared to throw in for a couple minutes. I've been impressed with what I've seen from him. And obviously it's been very limited minutes so far, but he looks like a guy that has a little bit left in the tank. Yeah. I was surprised by him last night and the block yeah. I know is called a foul, but damn dude, that thing he spiked that. Yeah. Uh, I was right. really surprised by that. I mean, when you look at Gary Harris, this is a guy that like, I don't know why you wouldn't if he's available. Like he hasn't uh, yeah, gotten I don't... waived yet. Right. No, nah, I don't think they are going to waive him. I mean, he's making 20 mil a year. He's playing like 30 minutes a game. He's not like the buyout candidate. The only real reason that like it's being talked about is because like the Magic want more minutes for the young guys that they have developed. Yeah. Gary Harris is not like a long-term plan. He's got that's like 28, which is still plenty of years in the tank, but they're more focused on like the the Fultzes and the, the, the younger 24 and below trying to develop. So there's still a chance it gets bought out. It's all got to be finalized by March 1st, so there's a little bit of time still. But uh. I don't know. I, I, I to my gut feeling says Gary Harris doesn't get bought out. Yeah, I mean, you think about it. He's averaging right now eleven points per game. You know, a couple rebounds, like not great, not awesome, but eighty five from the eighty five percent from the line, fifty one percent from the field, and thirty eight percent from three on five attempts. Like that's a guy you want on the floor. Uh, yeah. Good defender, athletic. Like if he's available, I don't know why you don't go get him. Um, I think the the you know, i mean really the realistically you have five bigs then if you're if you're bringing in another big and that's you know Embiid, Millsap, Reed um Bassie. Bassie, and then whoever else is being brought in and you know it sounds like it might be Robin Lopez like he might be uh in the mix which i don't know i don't know how you feel about Robin Lopez i'm i've never been a fan but like he'll do what you need him to do yeah that hook shot that I won't forget about that hook shot from last year's playoffs and how he hits that at about like a 99% field goal percentage from uh, my Somehow. memory. So that, that, that hook shot better fall in Philly. I won't, I do remember that. I mean, I, none of these guys like move my meter as far as like, you know, changing the title odds. I feel like I, I do really do strongly believe like a wing would be more impactful to this roster, but uh, I, 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 and I also have, I think I have more faith in just the collection of Bassey Reed and Millsap than I think the Sixers are showing. But I don't know. We'll see who it is. I'm sure it'll be some sort of veteran presence, some some Doc Rivers type of guy who he trusts for 10 minutes game or whatever. So can't hurt. Gotta love a Doc Rivers guy, right? Yeah. He's a dumbass. I, I hate to say it, but like it just bothers me sometimes. Um, but to move forward here, we, we had a little list of things you want to talk about. Um, so to go into that and then I do, before we go, I want to talk about, you know, we're talking about that podcast with Maury, um, him talking about, um, the trade that almost happened, the Bradley the Beal. other trade. Mm-hmm. You think it was well, Brad? He did not say who my, my takeaway was that it was Bradley Beal. Yes. I thought it was Tyrese Halliburton. Mm. 
Okay. The, I think I think it's either one of those two guys. Like yeah, that well, was in my thought it was one of the two. The line he said about the player getting hurt shortly before the deadline is what made me think Oh, he was, said it, hurt. Yeah, I I okay. think so. I believe he did. I thought he said there was he said that he couldn't disclose what happened like the four or five days before the deadline. Otherwise, like it would give away who it was. So like to me that was like, oh, like the the Kings oh, right. mm-hmm. the Kings were like, okay, we're moving on. We're gonna go, you know, do a different deal. Um but it could have been Bradley Beal, I mean, imagine, but uh, we yeah. can talk about that a bit later. So to go start here, you know, what is your overall grade for the Sixers in the first half of the season going into the all-star break? I'll go at A minus. I honestly, this to me, the expectations for the season they've for sure exceeded. I mean, now we're heading into the all-star break with a record 35 and 23, two and a half games out of first, sitting at third place in the East. That's all a lot better than I would have expected given the circumstances. Given that Joel Embiid has played without a co star, without a a true second best player this entire season. And I mean, to kind of just will this team in the spot we're at, we're right in the mix for the East, right amongst all the contenders and uh, a strong ending to the seat. Like ending first in the East is not out of the question by any means. Two and a half games really is not that much. It's a super tight race. And I'm, this is largely a, a tribute to Joel for just kind of carrying this team and like willing this team into the spot they're in. But the, I, I've been very impressed with how the team has looked overall. Yeah, I think I'm going to agree there. I was going to go B plus A minus range. Mm-hmm. Um, when you think about what we talked about, and for a while, even you know through the meat of the season so far, we had talked about them being you know a middle of the road team the whole time, and we were thinking they're going to be anywhere between like the three and seven seed in the East, and you know that's still possible. Let's not get ahead of ourselves too much, but yeah, this the the situation that they've put themselves in yeah. and the way that they've been playing. Uh, They've given themselves a chance. And I think that's all we can really ask for at this point. And, you know, maybe maybe we're a little, um, I don't know. I think last night really helped. I think if you asked me on Wednesday, I would have been like, yeah, they're there. But, well, you know, we're going to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, but last night, w- beating that team with Big without win. James Harden, without anyone else, um, you know, they can compete. They really can. And they're only going to get better. And it's not like, you know, it's not like incrementally better. They're getting like exponentially better. Like they're adding a Hall of Fame player to their roster. They're adding like a bona fide top 12 player in the league to their roster next time they play basketball. Um, so in my eyes, they're only going to get better. And the, the way that they've been able to hold themselves above water and not just be around, but compete at a high level uh, makes me give them, you know, and I would say an, an A minus is, I think, a good a good place to sit on. So yeah. to talk about the roster specifically, who's your biggest surprise so far this year? I'm torn. I think I'm still giving this to Joel. Just, just frankly, I, I, I think last year, at the end of last year, one of my biggest disappointments is I was like, we don't know if we're getting that Joel again. Like that generally might have been it. That might have been his ceiling. That might be the best basketball he ever plays in his life. And I'm so happy I was wrong about that because he's gotten better in just about every category this year. And I mean, uh, the leader for MVP, uh, averaging 32.9 minutes per game, 29.6 points, 4.5 assists, 11.2 rebounds shooting 36.9% from three, uh, all just terrific number. I mean, his efficiency splits are getting better as the season goes on, which has been fun to watch. His passing, I've been most impressed with his growth as a passer this yeah. year. That's a, just an area of his game that it's, – it's another thing that we've, like, pounded the table for so long on, but to, like, see it really, like, coming together. And just his basketball IQ has grown so much, yeah. too. You watch him just – orchestrating pointing at guys where to be where to stay knowing when the double's coming there's just like a this guy has ascended like leaped another level of stardom in this league which i'm thrilled to to watch and he deserves a ton of credit for it yeah absolutely um joel deserves all the credit i am going to give this to maxi though yeah that's Um, another one i think again and i know we talked about him having high expectations coming into this year and you and i uh really did have a lot of high expectations for him and you know we weren't all that concerned of handing the keys to him um, in terms of you know being the point guard and and the guard of the future here, but mm-hmm. the things that he's shown in a similar way to Embiid, where it's like okay, we had a really good foundation last year, and you know he had games where he wasn't playing last year, like he had games where he was just on the bench and he was playing you know the, in the playoffs, he was there. Like I know that it's you know Doc doesn't normally trust the young guys and it is what it is and whatever, but he came into this year and as a fully developed player, basically like he came in playing like 
you know, I, I don't have his stats up on me right now, but if you're looking at them, like compared to last year and, and the minutes and his production level is going up and shooting 40% from three. And what I, uh, I mentioned earlier on um, the passing from him and, mm -hmm. and the, the growth, seeing the game and understanding the game as a point guard, um, picking his spots. You talk about this stretch of games where Joel wasn't around uh, because of COVID and the way that he took over in that stretch, like, I think that obviously we expected a lot from him, but the expectations were actually lower than what he's been able to produce. And again, I think with the addition of James Harden, there's going to be a lot more for him to come. And I'm, I can't wait to see what he does uh, yeah. with a guard next to him like that. Yeah. And his per 36 numbers are just about the same as last year, which is like a, a super good indicator as far as like, this is consistent. This is legitimate. And it does not always happen for guys that like our, our bench players playing limited minutes. Like it basically shows that he made the leap in minutes and the stats came with him, which is super cool. Uh, and a, a testament to like, that is it's here to stay. Like that's a, a very good sign in terms of that. These are legitimate numbers. And I mean, we're seeing it like the, the, the eye test matches the stats. When you look at it, it's just like this guy and, and just a, such a fun player to watch too. Just like the way he goes about his business, the, the pace that he has, the everything it, it, he's a joy to watch play basketball. So Thrilled to have Maxi and very excited to see what he looks like alongside Harden as well. Yeah, and I think like one of the, he's one of those players that like when there was a play last night where they passed it ahead to him a little bit, like right above the opposite three point line, and he just took off. Yeah, he just and he flew up the floor. And mm -hmm. it's like I can't believe that that's a real person like running. Like it looks like mm -hmm. it's sped up, and you know he just like you said we've talked about this. Like you've said the he has that level of skill. Like, it's an actual skill. Um, his speed and the way he gets up and down the floor and. You know, finishing around the rim is something that he's gotten so much better at, and he's so creative. And I don't know. We could talk about Maxi. We could do a whole podcast about uh, why we love Tyrese Maxi. And you know, Maury did mention not to keep going back to that podcast, but he was like, "Yeah, he, he was untouchable." Um, and you know, he's like the ceiling of him is, you know, he has all these metrics that he talks about of you know mm -hmm. how to forecast what a player might be, and he was like, he's basically guaranteed to be like an above average starter in the NBA already. Like, and he's 21 in year two. Like, yeah, the, the metrics guarantee that essentially. Um, and he's a good chance to be an all star in the future. Like, this is what we have in store. Like, we have a guy that not only is, you know, showing statistically that he's there, but as a from a, a human standpoint, all accounts is a great kid. So, mm -hmm. um, to move in an opposite direction, the biggest disappointment of the year. And I think I know who you're going to say. Yeah, I, I think you're, gonna, I'm going to go with Furcon for my answer here. Okay. I, I mean, I think we're both we're both pretty well known team Furcon guys. It's yeah. been disappointing this year. Just, I mean, his three point percentage twenty nine point eight percent. Just can't be having that. You can't be having that if you're Furk. He's he's down to four point five attempts per game from three, which I I, I think there's been signs of for, for the first time in, ever in my memory of him being a little bit gun shy in ways. And I don't want to see that with Furk. I never want to see Furk losing his confidence. Uh, I will give him a shout out in the fact that. His role's changed a great deal, and he's done way more putting it on the floor. Uh, point guard for creating it a little bit, so the, he certainly he certainly has still helped this team in aspects and uh, been a, a serviceable player. He's also a guy that I do have hope will bounce back as the season goes. As Harden's here, as he'll have shots created, and I do think he's due for like a hot streak to to round that number back up a little bit. But I, I have been disappointed for what I've seen out of Ferk so far this year. Yeah, I was gonna agree. I was gonna say the same thing. I wanted to say Danny Green. Um, but I feel like the the lack of production in Danny Green was kind of expected without uh, yeah. a facilitator on the floor. Like he doesn't make it himself. He's also been in and out hurt a decent bit too, true. which is hard. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Danny Green just he pisses me off sometimes. Like just <laughs> like just the way that he he is. Uh, he had a mid range shot last night. Like this is like yeah. dribbled in and pulled up, and I was like, <laughs> what? But anyway, I I am gonna go with Furk on here, and disappointing in. I'm disappointed that he's not playing well. Not I'm disappointed in Furcon. Like I want the world for Furcon. I he's like one of my favorite Sixers ever. Like he's one of those guys that just I have immense love for for like whatever reason. And maybe it's the like the accent and the broken English. I just think is funny and he's an enjoyable guy. But um, when he plays well, he's a legit like threat. He's a legit yeah. player. Um, and there's times last night. There was a couple plays last night where. You know, he catches on the screen and roll and he gets downhill and he's actually gotten much better at that. Yeah, uh, it's just that. disappointing that the three point shot hasn't carried over with it, because if he was able to be doing that, um, you know, I don't know. He shot upper 30s last year in percentage. Like if he was able to continue to do that, 
and like you said, I think you know the shot didn't go away. It just uh, he just had a rough stretch, and that happens to guys. Um, so like you said, I'm hoping that there's a bounce back. But if he's able to to be that type of player that can you know create off the dribble a little bit, the passing has gotten better. He's creative in that sense. Um, he gets to the rim. He's also like a quirky finisher. He's able to do some funny things around the rim that end up working. But if the three point shot is falling, the pump fake is still lethal. He hit a, he hit one after that last night, which we talked yeah. about how he never missed those. Uh, we saw him miss a bunch of those, which was disappointing. But last night we saw heartbreaking. It really is. Um, but we saw him get back in, in on track last night and hoping that's a good, you know, push into this all star break so he can come back and be a competitive player again. Mm-hmm. So the biggest hope for the second half improvement. What are you thinking on that? Uh, I'm sneaky giving this to Shake Milton. I think Shake has pretty oh, yeah. much been uh, a non-factor on this team this year. He's also been hurt for a great deal. Uh, only play, played 31 games total this year. As much as Harden and Maxi will dominate the the point guard minutes and the on ball minutes, I still think there's uh, Shake will rotate in and get some time. He's looked better as a passer since he's come back. In my, I've, I've paid pretty close attention to that. Like he seems consciously like trying to include guys, finding guys more. Uh, which like if if he can carry that over, that's huge for him being like a point guard, and he he still has a skill set that like the Sixers team needs, and especially in like the like I I think he's it, it, as much as we compared him to Maxi a decent bit, like when these guys first were kind of both bursting on the scene, they do contrast themselves in kind of a way that I like, is in terms of like the Maxi's the one hundred percent speed go, and Milton's more yeah. just like the calming presence, smooth and that, and uh, I. I, I think there's a role for him if he can get back to playing his game and I've hoped for him in the second half. You forget about Shake sometimes. You yeah. Know? You I, I feel like we've forgotten about Shake a lot. And you know, we've kind of gone on this roller coaster with him going from like he's a non factor to he might be God to yeah. okay, he's kind of just in the middle and to the league hasn't caught up to Shake Milton yet, which is kind of our tagline at this point. Um but I love Shake. I love his game um, when he's playing well. And like he played well last night. He creates shots that I, I don't think a lot of other like he's able to kind of make something out of nothing. And mm-hmm. the only other guy I can really think of in obviously a different way is Joel. But like the, the rest of the team, there's not a lot of guys that are able to like kind of just snap their fingers and get a shot off really at any time. And his length and size um, creates that for him. And I like yeah. that pick for for and maybe like with, you know, Maxi being in that lineup and, you know, if he's able to stay healthy in this next like stretch of the year, like maybe that could be, you know, shake time in that second unit. And I don't mind that um, yeah, if yeah. he's able to kind of get, you know, play consistently if he's improving as a passer like we've seen. That could be, you know, a really good uh, little role for him. And again, Definitely. like you said, he's smooth and, and he's night like he, he's one of those guys that like. You almost don't want to look at the stats. And when he has good games, you're just like, he's nice. Like he looks good. He looks smooth. His game is like appealing. He's a handsome kid. <laughs> Not to get too far ahead of myself, but really love and shake. Today. Yeah, he really loves shake today. But no, seriously, I, I I do like that pick, and I and I think that um that could be the way it goes for him the rest of this year. So mm-hmm. our final question, and I I do know the answer to this. I know the answer that I feel, and I'm pretty sure that I know the answer for you as well. But are the Sixers true contenders? This is tough. I last night is absolutely firm in my mind as I as I think about this. the The wing depth is what concerns me more than anything. I just I, I look at the collection of uh, Matisse, Danny Green, Isaiah Joe, Furkan, even George Nia. There, there's all guys who have their own quirks and. I, I, I struggle thinking about the matchups, but even like like George Nian cannot guard Giannis in the seven game series. Like that just can't be the strategy. And same when I think about matching up with guys like Jalen Brown. And I guess that's my biggest area of concern is just matching up on the wing. Uh but the hardest part is getting the top end talent and James Harden and Joel Embiid is as a duo, you can't ask for much more. So I do believe the NBA is a star driven league. I still think there's holes in this roster, but I, I, I think the Sixers are here to compete and are legitimate contenders. I believe that as well. Um, and you talk about every every team has a hole in their roster somewhere. Maybe not the Suns. Maybe maybe not the Suns. Pretty perfect. Because they're just ridiculous. But uh, maybe not the Suns, but every other team has you know deficiencies somewhere, some way. Um, yeah. And the way that I look at it is there's not a human in the world that's, that's stopping Joel Embiid. 
And I had that conversation with one of my friends last night. I'm like, a seven-game series, if you stop him one game, congratulations, you got one. You're not going to get six more. You're not even going to get one more, probably. The way that we've seen Embiid play this year, you're not getting one more. Um, and, you know, a lot of people look back at that Celtics game and say this or that or whatever. That I could have slept through that game and not missed a thing and wouldn't have cared. You yeah. move on, he drops 42 points against the reigning champs. Like, that's what you're looking at. And I, and I think, realistically, um, the Sixers have an advantage that no other team has. And while they do have disadvantages elsewhere, uh, the Embiid advantage is is significant uh, and will keep them in a you know, in contention through this playoffs. And I'm hoping, I'm just, I'm just hoping and praying that this is a, you know, they find a way to really make this work and really make this happen. Um, and at least give us like a real run. I feel like the Sixers haven't had a real title run yet. And like, even if it ends in the Eastern conference finals, even if it ends in the finals or, you know, even if they have like a, a knockout drag out series against somebody, you know, and they go down swinging, that's one thing, but I can't deal with the bullshit series, the losses to nobody's, the yeah. you know the 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 losing to the Celtics and losing to this whoever I can't do it anymore. The last time I felt real hope was that Raptors series, and I need that again. Uh, we're four years, three years removed from that. I think this season they do have a chance, maybe not to win the title, but to be contenders and and you know to be a serious threat to win the championship. Yeah, no, I'm I'm all about it. I I think Joel specifically, just his evolution is. I think him and Harden are both at the stage where they just want to win, that they, they're willing to do like take the back seat, do whatever. It's it's very cool to me. Just when you think about this James Harden situation, James Harden looked at Joel Embiid and said, That guy is my best chance to win a championship. I, I believe I have a better chance of winning a championship with Joel Embiid than I think I do with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, which is pretty crazy right there. And yeah. that that right there was like the driving force of Harden coming to Philly. And this has been a long time coming. This is the place he wanted to be. But just kind of that respect around the league and that like direct acknowledgement of what we already know is is very cool to me. And I think like I that shouldn't get lost in the shuffle, how like James Harden looked at this team, looked at Joel Embiid, and said, "Like that, this is my best chance of winning a championship." So, if James James Harden believes it, I do too. Yeah, I think, I think that is, you know, something that I, not a lot of people have talked about uh, is is the fact that Harden was like, you know, I want to be there, and yeah. I wanted to be there uh, from the start. So, um, I don't know, man. It's I'm not, I'm trying not to get too ahead of myself. We haven't even seen James Harden in a Sixers uniform yet. Um, and you know, things, things are still up in the air, but the way that I see it with the way that Embiid's playing and the way that this team is rallied around him and from everything we've heard from Daryl Morey, from George Niang, from Embiid, from everyone that's talked about it, that they all feel great right now. And this energy that Harden is bringing and, you know, the way he's already inserted himself with this team and talking about, you know, Morey said he wasn't even supposed to go to Milwaukee. Uh, the yeah. training staff wanted him to stay in Philadelphia and he said, no, I'm going. I need to be on the bench and I need to go to the team dinner afterwards. Like that means a lot, um, especially from the stories and the bullshit that we've heard from the guy that just left. So like that type of thing matters. Yeah. Um, and he's got this reputation of being this or that or whatever. I don't want to buy into any of it because everything we've seen so far here is that he's been a great teammate. Um, he's brought great energy. He's been not, you haven't seen any clip or video or picture of him where he's not smiling and not looking happy and, and be the same way. Um, and Maxi, obviously like he's always smiling anyway, but like, I think that's really important that the energy and, and the, and the vibe around the team is great. Um, and on top of that, you're adding James Harden, like to the Sixers team. Like every time we talk about it, I feel like it's, I'm dreaming. So like I, I made yeah. this up somehow, but it's real. Like James Harden is about to be a Sixer. Well, he is a Sixer. He's about to play for the Sixers. So, yeah, you know, they have a chance. I think yeah. they do. Still doesn't quite feel real either, but that first time that he puts on a uniform, hits a little step back, has a, a dazzling pass to to Embiid, it's yeah. it's all gonna feel right. So, uh, season starts after the All Star break, and we're, we're full force ahead then. Yeah, absolutely, man. So, uh, check out Sean on Twitter at Sean underscore Bernard one. You can follow me at JSPerrin seventeen. Follow the pod at Pixwap Pod. Check out the YouTube Pixwap Podcast. Follow us. Check us out anywhere you can get your podcast. Make sure to check out BetUS. Use our code PICKSWAP as a first-time user. And we'll talk to you guys, I guess, after the All-Star break. It'll be a while. Um, but maybe we'll do one in the middle of the week. 
uh, right yeah. before they play again on Thursday, next Thursday against the Timberwolves. So uh, maybe we'll do one right before then. 